We left off where Peter and John were headed to the temple for the hour of prayer. And there laid at the foot of the gate called Beautiful, a crippled man from birth. He laid there begging for alms to Peter and John as they walked towards the temple. And Peter and John, they stopped and they fixed their eyes on the man. And, and Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And Peter lifted the man up, and he leaped up and, leaped up and stood and walked. The man leaped with joy, and he was praising God, and went with Peter and John into the temple. But the religious Jews that were there, they noticed the man, and they were amazed at what they saw. Seeing him for 40 years, laying there crippled at the gate, now he stands healed. And this religious Jews began to go to Peter and John. They were looking at them, and Peter saw this, and he responded to them saying, hey, this was not, this was not me who did this. See, I didn't heal this guy. It was his faith in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that healed him. Peter then explained through a biblical and prophetic basis that Jesus, whom they killed and whom God raised up from the dead, is the Christ, the Holy One, and the servant of God. But he also told them that they did not uh, do this killing. Uh, um, they did it out of ignorance. They didn't know what they were doing. But through them, the things which God foretold through his prophets that the Christ would suffer was fulfilled. Even though they did not know what they were doing, but what they did was not excused. It did not excuse them from their sin. So he tells them to repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Peter then again lays out the scriptures so that they would believe in them and not just take his word for it. He reminds them that through the seed of Abraham, all families of the earth shall be blessed. And then says, to you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So he was saying that Jesus alone can save you and forgive you of your sins and give you new life. God the Father sent him to bless you in this way. And we pick things up on Acts chapter 4, verse 1. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. So here we see the priests and Sadducees are showing up at the scene, right? Coming with the captain of the temple, which was pretty much the police of the, the temple precinct. And they came together and came upon them, meaning they came with them at force. They came to seize them, and that's exactly what they did. They seized Peter and John with a quickness to arrest him. And for what? Verse 2, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So first of all, <clears throat> the priests were primarily Sadducees that are on this scene. And these priests along uh, that you see uh, were the Sadducees as well. So they were all primarily of the same affiliation. And what is unique about them is they were a very small sect, and they were very powerful of the religious Jews. And not only did they deny the existence of angels or spirits, but they also did not believe, which is a huge difference between them and the Pharisees, they didn't believe in the bodily resurrection. The Sadducees were known to be the theological liberals of their day. They could not believe in anything that they could not understand. So essentially, you would have these people that have this worship of the human mind. And the mind, as we all know, is a very small thing to worship. The mind definitely has its limitations. And with limitations, they ended up putting God in a box. That is based on their own understanding. It's a small box. They didn't believe in miracles or the supernatural and definitely did not believe in the resurrection. That was their main, like, nope, they took their stance. They did not believe in the resurrection. And to me, they might as well not have believed in God, man. They might as well believe just completely in themselves. Because that's just, you're just, you're, you're basically putting God in a box if by this point with your beliefs. But here, we have Peter and John. They come teaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we see that God uses Peter and John to destroy their theology. And you can see why 
the Sadducees were deeply disturbed. What they taught opposed the Sadducees directly. And it's interesting, but it's obvious that this religious sect of the Sadducees would become the greatest enemies of the Christians. Because these guys were very wealthy, and they were wealthy off religion, equivalent to making millions in our day. They handled all the money for the temple and the money exchange for the animals during the feasts. It went to them. And with hundreds of thousands that would come to these feasts, you knew they banked. Because it was hundreds of thousands each feast. And so this gospel message that was being taught was a threat to them. It would shake their establishment. So it was very serious. And they were greatly disturbed. Verse 3, and they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. So already evening, we know that the time was after 3 p.m. It was too late to hold the trial by then. So they were taken into custody where they were held in a jail cell. And they did this thinking that this would intimidate them and put fear in them. And that it would send a message to those who were listening and watching this unfold. Now, I'm sure for Peter and John, this wasn't quite on their plan. That wasn't on their agenda today. They were just going to go to the temple and prayer and pray, you know. But and, and then they ended up in jail. And for what? For preaching the truth of Jesus Christ. The opportunity opened and they stepped into it. Now, when I read this, I had to ask myself, would I be willing to risk getting taken to jail for preaching the gospel so people may be saved? Well, of course I would. Come on, it's Jesus, right? I mean, yeah, I'll die for him. I would do. Hey, so <laughs> before we answer quickly like that, kind of like how Peter did, you know, before, before the bonfire for Jesus, I really want you to seriously think about that. And let the question really search us. Ask yourself, are you willing to risk being arrested or risk it all for preaching the truth of Jesus Christ? I mean, really? In the, in the days that we're in, we need to search our hearts. For the apostles, it meant that they were willing to give their lives, their very lives, for the sake of telling the truth so that people may be saved. They were willing to be arrested for the sake of preaching the gospel. It meant everything to them to be used by God at whatever cost. They were witnesses. And if you remember when I talked about the word witness, the translation for witness was martyr. They were willing to give their life. You know, a lot of us in this room, we've all heard the gospel message. Probably heard it in so many different ways and probably heard it so often that to us it become very familiar, maybe extremely familiar to the point where it's just kind of like it gets placed in the back of our minds sometimes and we're trying to understand everything else. Are you willing, I mean, with the knowledge that we have of the gospel to bring it to the forefront, to bring it to the reality of our daily lives? Are you willing to get uh, arrested for the sake of that gospel? It's not... It's not something that we should ever in our lives be very comfortable with. It's something that we should walk in and believe and stand firm in it, that we have the assurance of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not something we should ever be familiar with. This, this was something that I felt the Lord was really speaking. He was digging in the heart of it, and I, and I just encourage everybody just, again, to search your hearts in that. Search your hearts in that and say, hey, Lord, if I was ever put in that situation, really try to picture what these guys were going through. How would I have responded? And then just be at peace, you know, be at peace. I mean, I mean the same context of what these guys were dealing with. So let this question search your hearts today. I just want to throw that out there. So the apostles were taken in custody until the next day because it was evening already. However... I love how Luke puts this here. He says, verse 4, However, meaning despite Peter and John being arrested by the Sadducees, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to about 5,000. Wow. The Sadducees may have taken Peter and John in custody, but the word of God cannot be taken into custody. 
5,000, and that's just counting the men, as we can see, they believed. And I remember a couple weeks back when Peter stood and gave another sermon, 3,000 were saved. And here, you know, Peter, all he did, he spoke the word of God and preached the gospel. Despite the opposition trying to shut God's word, well, the word of God cannot be bound. That's the power, brothers and sisters, that's the power of the word of God, is that even when spoken directly to a few, that by speaking the, the word of God, those who were listening, because there's always those that are going to be like, what is, what's he talking about, you know, or to maybe scoot a little bit closer just so they can get that good hearing ear like mine, the right ear, to hear what is being said, and they will receive the truth. But it's up to us to learn and understand God's word. Remember Hebrews 4.12? Y'all remember Hebrews 4.12? You heard me say this, one, this verse before, but here it is again. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, which is the physical body, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12, if anything, write the scripture down, know it. Read this verse. Hebrews 4.12, okay, Hebrews 4.12, <laughs> the word of God is living and powerful, amen? Now, it was the miracle in this context, in this case, that got everyone's attention. But when they heard the word of God, 5,000 believed. Peter knew that you're not going to receive salvation through a miracle. It wasn't going to be because of that. It would be through the gospel the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that they would be saved if they believed. So far, if you see this, 8,000 people were saved. Two great opportunities, not bad. So what we need to do, no, I'm just joking. Don't think that this high number is what we are aiming for. All right, don't look at this and say, I'm going to be Peter for the day. I'm going to go in Clarksville and Sango, and we're going to get 8,000. No, we're not going to do that. All we need to do is listen for the Lord one person at a time. One person at a time. And as Pastor Jerry McAtonty taught me, he said, simply love the one in front of you. Invest in that one that God has placed in front of you in that moment. But Peter and John would pay a price for speaking the truth of Jesus to the people, and it's called persecution. Jesus had spoken, warned them about these things which Peter and John were experiencing. And it's funny that when Jesus spoke about the persecution that they would face, it would not be from, like, the agnostics. It would not be from the atheist or the Greeks. No, it would be from the Jewish religious leaders. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 1 through 4, says, These things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. And who is that? The Jewish leaders. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Who is that? The Jewish leaders. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, not if or maybe, no, when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. Ever notice the most of uh, Jesus' warnings of persecution always, always was the religious leaders? They were the ones that constantly showed up towards him. Ever notice that? Peter and John are now in custody because of the same people, the same religious leaders. But Jesus spoke these things so that they would remember his words to expect this, to not fear. It's like, don't fear it. Expect it. Be encouraged because you know that you hear my words speaking this truth. Be encouraged. Peter and John are now experienced this. Verse 5, and it came to pass, so now we've, we've gone through the night, and here comes morning, and it came to pass on the next day, that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. So the next morning, 
and I think Luke's description says it all. Here we have the all-powerful Sanhedrin assembled. This was a Jewish council of 71 of the most powerful men in the country of Israel. And you will have two fishermen from Galilee who were looked down upon as uneducated hicks to be brought before the most highly educated and teachers of Israel. These were rulers, elders, and scribes. And scribes were like the lawyers of the law. And there we see Annas, the high priest, who technically was not the active high priest at this time. Okay? But the Romans, the officials there, they did not like dealing with Caiaphas. They didn't. So they recognized Annas as the high priest and would only deal with him, not Caiaphas. But Caiaphas was technically the high priest uh, at this time. But we see both of these high priests there. And look, and the family of all the former high priests were there. These are some powerful, powerful people. So the all-powerful Sanhedrin was assembled, which was like a, like a Jewish supreme court. It was that high court. And this was a scene of power and intimidation. Now, these rooms weren't all that big. Okay, that they would meet in, probably be about the size of what we have in this room. And you would have two seats right here that would kind of stack where you have a row of people sitting here and then the second row. And this would be this complete horseshoe and you would have the high priests, you know, at the sitting on their chair over here on, right in the middle of it. So we're talking a room that is surrounded by 71 of these fellas. And you have John and uh, Peter that would be set right in the midst of them. So they bring them in, and when they had set them in the midst, they ask, by what power or by what name have you done this? Now, their line of questioning in this setting is a legal question. Okay, According to Deuteronomy chapter 13, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and does a miracle, you are to ask. You are to understand by what power or what name they have done that just like the Sanhedrin did. So if they answered with anything or anyone or any other God other than the God of Israel, they were a false prophet. And they would be, if they're basically uh, leading the people of Israel astray, they would be handled accordingly by death. So what the Sanhedrin is doing right here is basically their job. It wasn't like this, you know, they're going straight for the you know, jugular with Jesus. They, they were just asking straight up. And the fact is, in the midst of all this, these guys in the Sanhedrin, they were faced with a miracle. They couldn't deny it. There was a miracle that just happened, and they couldn't deny it even if they wanted to or tried to. They couldn't sweep this one under the rug because this certain man who had been crippled for 40 years had been a fixture in their community for that long. And people were very, very familiar of him. So the Sanhedrin asked, by what authority or by what name have you done this? In other words, they wanted to know, who are these two Galileans going to point us to? Well, Peter, who has been on a roll with opportunities, said, and it says right here in verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, notice he was filled with the Holy Spirit, okay? Before anything, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. It's crazy when you think about it because he was just in jail, most people would be deflated, upset, scared, intimidated, maybe depressed, because now they're being brought before the Sanhedrin. But Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is important for us to see. It is, a, it is the very reason why I ask the Lord to freshly fill us. Every time that we assemble, every time that we gather, Lord, freshly fill us with your Holy Spirit, so that when we approach the Word of God, we are freshly filled for the Holy Spirit to speak freshly into our hearts and minds. We need this filling in our life all day. We should always seek to be filled, always wanting to be filled, especially just like Peter here in the midst of his difficult trial. So Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Oh, he's showing some respect, huh? If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well or whose name is behind this miracle, let it be known to you all 
and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and I'm pretty sure that everyone of the council is very familiar with that name, and we have to remember, he says in the name of Jesus Christ, that Christ was not Jesus' last name. Christ in Greek is Christos, which is also means the Messiah in Hebrew. This is a title. It's not his last name. This is a title for the anointed one. Peter said, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man stands here before you whole. Man, the Holy Spirit gave Peter the grace to stand with boldness and respond to their question in just one answer with the gospel. Jesus is alive, and it's by him that this man stands before you whole, fully healed. And then he tells them, this is the stone, speaking of Jesus, which was rejected by you builders, which has come, become the chief cornerstone. And now as we see what Peter does, he begins to speak prophecy in scripture, and he's referring to Psalm 118, Verse 22, where, the, where it says the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We can only be saved through Jesus Christ. Jesus, meaning Yahweh is salvation, who is the Messiah, the Christ, there is no other name under heaven, or all over the earth, given among men by which we must be saved. There's no other name, just one that we would call upon. And so here is Peter, surrounded by the Sanhedrin, this religious council, and he was not intimidated. But rather he stands there and answers with boldness by declaring the truth of Jesus Christ. And we will see that the room went silent at this moment. Just everybody was like, they were gazing at them. Watch verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. They're like, these guys, are you sure these are the, the hicks from you know, Galilee, the fishermen? Are you sure? Now, I will say this to you and us and myself included as an exhortation, that when or if ever, you are faced in a situation of intimidation when asked about the truth. Never bend on it. Don't cave in. Jesus is the only way to salvation. There are not many roads to heaven or different avenues to, to make your way to God through, you know, Buddha or whatever. No. You cannot merit heaven as well. Just because you're a good person, that's not going to win you anything it's not the truth. Listen, we, we know that there is only one way to salvation. We know that in this room. And it's through the only one who filled the Old Testament prophecies. And that's a huge, if you see, that's how they preach the gospel. It was through the Old Testament scriptures, how he fulfilled the prophecies. And his name is Jesus, period. Jesus Christ, that's it. So no matter the pressure or the circumstance, just never cave. Never came on the truth. The Sanhedrin saw these Galileans as uneducated and untrained men, meaning they never sat under a teacher of Israel in one of their rab rab rabbinical, rabbin how would you say that? Rabbinical. rabbinical, thank you, schools. Like how the Apostle Paul, he studied under Gamaliel. And they viewed them as untrained men. In other words, you're not even qualified to speak. <laughs> they just looked down upon them. But do you think that Jesus knew this when he chose them? That these fellows that he called were untrained men or uneducated men? I mean, these fellows were fishermen. That's what they knew. That's what their livelihood was all about. And yet Jesus called them. By man's standards, these apostles are not qualified to even speak, to teach the scriptures. But yet Jesus called them to. Jesus knew exactly who he chose and how he would use them. Jesus qualified them for his calling on their lives. 
The Sanhedrin saw that they had no theological degree or education, and look how they responded. They marveled. They were amazed. They were blown away. Like, how are they speaking like this? How is this possible? But check this out. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. They knew that what they had listened to, you know, sounded very familiar. They heard this before, you know, and with seeing it with this such boldness. This same council questioned the same thing of Jesus. Remember when they stood in John chapter 7 and said, the, when Jesus, as at the middle of the feast, went up and to the temple and taught? And even there, the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters, having never studied? You know, they were sitting there going, hey, we've, we're, we've seen this before. Now, although these apostles had never had formal training from the rabbis, they had been educated in two important ways. First, they studied the scriptures. They studied them. They were well-versed in them. And second, as we see here, they had been with Jesus. They were called by him. What's awesome about this that I don't want anybody to miss is that the Sanhedrin realized that they heard that these things before. They heard this themselves from Jesus himself before. But what is so cool about this is that they recognized Jesus in the midst of their presence. And they did not realize that Jesus was speaking through the apostles by the Holy Spirit. Oh, to be used by God in that way, right? It's awesome. And what I mean is that everything, they, the, the Lord was with them. The Lord was indwelling with them. And he was given the very words to Peter to speak in front of these guys, and they recognized Jesus. They didn't recognize Peter and them. They just recognized, oh. I've heard this before. So I'm, I'm here to encourage you, never fear when God places the opportunity before you. Jesus says he will never leave you nor forsake you. He is with you. He will give you everything you need to hear or say. He's there. He's not going to leave you and say, okay, you deal with that. This is proof while they were in the midst of this trial that the Lord was with them and the Lord was using them and the Lord was speaking and giving them wisdom through it. Jesus' presence was felt just by the words of Peter. Amen? That's awesome. Verse 14, And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could not say anything against it. The miracle was right there standing right in their face. They couldn't deny it. They couldn't hide it. So the only thing they could do was just stay silent. Think about it. Think about this moment. These two Galileans just silence the teachers of Israel. These were experts. They, they were silent. They couldn't say anything, and I think it's amazing. But when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred among themselves. So they sent Peter and John out. Hey, we're gonna, we need to talk about this kind of thing. They sent them out. And what's interesting is what we're going to see right here, uh, this kind of conversation that happens within the Sanhedrin. Now, look, Luke here tells us all the things that was being discussed. I mean, how would Luke get this information that took place on the inside? The only thing that comes to my mind is two people. We have a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus, who was a, a teacher of Israel, who might have been there. And then there's this other former Pharisee that we all know of, Paul. You know, he might have been in there as well. He was under Gamaliel, and he was always with him. And we know from the story of Paul that he was always around these high-ranking official, officials, Sanhedrin priests and all that, so he kind of carried a lot of credibility with him. So I believe that they would have had this kind of access uh, to such information. So they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it, but so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. You know what's interesting? They acknowledge that a miracle had been done. They said they couldn't deny it in these verses. Even the truth was presented to them from Peter. I mean, it silenced them. And it's as if they didn't want to even just hear it. They didn't want to see it. 
The corruption of their heart is something that even us in this room can see. We can hear it, and we cannot deny that they were more into self-preserving their sinful interests. They had not a care about the people. They just had a heart condition and refused to submit to God. I mean, Jesus even told them, hey, believe it. If you don't believe in me, believe in the works of the Father. You know, believe in him that he did these things. So they are, they are here now confronted by this miracle and this name, Jesus. So what do they do? It's the same old people, same old thing. They plotted to threaten them to keep their mouth shut, to never speak this name to no man. So they called them in and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. So they commanded them. It wasn't saying, hey, you're no longer. No, they, you are not to. It was difference. They commanded them. Do you see the problem with this, though? Jesus commanded them in Mark 16, 15 to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus told them in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, teaching to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So the Sanhedrin was telling the apostles to disobey, disobey, even what Jesus had commanded them to do. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. <laughs> They're like, they refuse to do it. It's like, nope. I'm sure this is exactly what the Sanhedrin wanted to hear. The apostles were basically telling them that we're here to obey God and do what pleases him. And you are telling us to disobey God? Not going to happen. Should we listen to you or should we listen to God? And that might, that's a two-edged sword for them already, you know, confronted with that. But I want you to see that by God's grace, they had the courage to say this to them. They were not bending. They were not caving. They were speaking the truth. And remember, they are surrounded by this council. And there's nothing about where they are standing that was comfortable. There was nothing in that moment where they just weren't a little bit, kind of had a little bit of anxiety, you know. They're, they're just like us, you know. But they had already decided that they were going to stand firm in the Lord. So verse 21, when they had hurt, for, uh, when, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what that has been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. You see the significance of why the Lord, Jesus might have passed him a couple of times and said, I can't, I won't, it's not your time yet. You see how powerful that is now? Sometimes in the midst when we want the answer right away and the Lord tells us no, we don't see the big picture we just want to, you know, like, do this now, you know. But when we wait, it's later on that we say, okay, I understand now. I see why the Lord had me wait. Thank you, Lord, for making me wait because everything worked out for your glory. And we stand here and we, we can witness this in our own lives. And we see it right here. That there was nothing they could say. There was nothing they can do. This man was a walking testimony of the truth. This miracle had happened in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And being let go, verse 23, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So they went straight to their, like what we would all do, you know, uh, go to their people. They were probably worried not hearing from them since 3 p.m. the day before, you know, hey, we're going to go pray and then just not come back for the whole night. But here we see them tell them everything. And look at the response. So when they heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord. Immediately hearing the, the account of John and Peter, they raised their voices in one accord. They went straight into prayer, realizing that now things are getting real. They're getting real. The Jewish religious leaders would be like a hornet's nest that was just stirred up. 
So they go before the Lord in prayer and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And I love this because we all, we all acknowledge God in this matter. They turned to God and acknowledged God's sovereign power, his sovereignty, the creator of heaven and earth. He is greater than all things. And although the Sanhedrin seemed like something big in their lives right now, and they were powerful, they come into this prayer knowing that God is bigger and more powerful than they are. This was for them. They weren't, they weren't telling God what he, you know, what he already knew. <laughs> this was for them to, to hear this in their own ears, you know, God, you are bigger. Sometimes we, we do that in our prayers. We acknowledge him first before we bring our supplication and our request before him. God, you, you are almighty. You are sovereign. You are on the throne. And he goes in verse 25, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So they begin to, to prayer in scripture, Psalm 2. They see how God prophesied already, already mentioned of this, this persecution, even just as Jesus told them in John 15, hey, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. This persecution was coming. So they pray this scripture, and it begins to speak to them. For truly against your holy servant, Jesus, verse 27, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So as we see in verse 26 and 27, they realize that the fight is not really with them, but with God. These people were coming after God. All the things that Jesus spoke, they were attacking God. Jesus was just speaking his, the words from the Father. They see that God also is very sovereign and declare that they were gathered together to do whatever God's will is for his hand and his purpose that has already been determined to be done, that they were ready to stand and do his work. They were ready to serve the Lord. And what I love about it is that they give him praise for it, that he is on the throne and is in control. But when they come before them with him with petition, they ask in verse 29, now, Lord, look on their threats. And we have to remember that this was a different time in the world. Well, you can almost say that we're doing a full circle, but they, when they made threats, they meant that they were going to cause serious bodily harm. And there are times when it's just not one guy or two guys doing this, but mobs of 10 to 20 to 50 you know, you got to remember with the stoning, it just didn't have, happen with one guy, one rock at a time. No, a group of people, a mob of people would pick up a stone to stone somebody. So they petition and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. By stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Do you see that not one time in their prayer they asked God to stop the persecution. They prayed for boldness, that in times that when they are weak, that they may speak his word. And in verse 30, they asked God that he would stretch out his hand, meaning grant them his power to, to heal, do signs and wonders through the name of Jesus. Verse 31, and when they had all prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. My friends, God hears the prayer. He hears their prayer for boldness, and then he fills them up with the Holy Spirit and gave them the boldness to speak the word of God. Now, when we ask in prayer and we petition for things, that we, we must realize that our prayer must be aligned with God's will. It's not so I can have, you know, the, the next Dodge Ram, you know, or built to serve truck. No, it's, it's for the things that align with his will. And when we pray like that, aligned with his will, his answer is yes and amen. 
And what I love about this verse here in Acts chapter 4 is you see them praying and being filled with the Holy Spirit for the boldness that they needed. And we in this room, we all have the Holy Spirit, right? But when we need that refill, we can go before the Lord and ask him to be refilled. That is aligned in his will. We need to be refilled in the circumstance that we are facing. And I just love that God is faithful. His answer is yes and amen. Now, the multitude of those who believed were at, of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold um, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed them as anyone had need. So we have a beautiful picture of the body believers sharing all things and would sell their stuff to help each other out. Now, I don't know why I'm, I'm thinking this, but these folks had to rely on each other. So that must, and I don't want to speak into this, but the, the Pharisees at that time were making straight, you know, commands out there that if you speak his name, that they would be kicked out of the synagogues. So it makes me wonder if at this point, you know, these folks who were proclaiming these believers the name of Jesus Christ, you know, because when you're, when you're excommunicated in that way, you really don't have a whole lot that you can you know, have access to, you know, besides the synagogues, you're kind of almost excommunicated out of the community. It just makes me, it's food for thought that maybe during that time, we have some people that were still within the community that were able to sell things and they just kind of provided for each other. But what, what we are seeing is people here regarding people more than material things, all because God had touched their lives. Now, of course, the church did not establish this and require this of people to do this as an early form of communism. <laughs> this is called koinonia, which is a form of sharing, and we'll touch more into that in chapter 5. So all the proceeds that they made from selling their land and possession, they took, and they laid them at the apostles' feet, and they disturb, uh, distributed to each and anyone that had need. And Joseph Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translate, translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And this is our introduction to Barnabas. We'll see quite a bit of him throughout the book of Acts, whose, whose gift was encouragement. And it's interesting that Luke mentions the fact that he's a Levi, Levite, you know, and that he was also from Cyprus yet he sold his land in Israel. But the part that's interesting is that as a Levite, and according to Numbers chapter 18, Levites were not given land, nor were to possess any land for themselves. But Barnabas, who was from Cyprus, owned land in Israel, perhaps by marriage. His wife had maybe the land, and they're, here they are right now selling it. But most of the old traditions you know, at that time were no longer observed, but they sold it to the apostles and they distribute it according to the need. So as we close, I just want us to reflect on what we learned this morning. How we've seen Peter and John respond in the midst of this opposition. They responded in a world that opposed the name of Jesus Christ. That he was willing to be bold and speak the truth. Even in the face of intimidation or threats. Severe threats at that. Peter did not cave. He did not cave. He stood for the Lord. He spoke the truth. We recognize through the words of Jesus that we are to expect this kind of persecution for his name's sake. We saw how Peter petitioned the Lord to be strengthened, being filled by the Holy Spirit. And Peter declared that God is on the throne and sovereign, and he will do whatever God wills him to do. He asked for boldness in the face of persecution. What an example we see in Peter. So much to learn especially in the days that we are living in. Persecution of the believers is very real in the world today that we live in. Can we all agree with that? It's happening. 
that the devil now is trying to keep the church doors closed even in our nation. As we leave here this morning, I just, it's just weighing heavy on my heart to just search your heart in, in your quiet time with the Lord and reflect on your relationship with the Lord. Reflect on what the gospel means in your own personal life and ask yourself, are you willing to be used by God even in the face of opposition, persecution, even if it comes to being arrested because of the truth of Jesus Christ without caving? As Peter declared in his prayer, I believe the Lord wants you to see God is bigger than anything that can ever come against you. He is in control. He is on the throne. I know we prayed Saturday morning. And when the Lord put on my heart that when Isaiah lifted his eyes to the heaven, he saw God on the throne. And when Stephen, you know, was being martyred, he was being stoned, he lifted his eyes to the heaven and he saw God seated on the throne. I want you guys to see this, that in the midst of your circumstance, in your everyday life, either through your struggles or through your victories, remember that the God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, he is still on the throne today in the midst of the chaos that is screaming in our face every day, every hour. He is on the throne. And he will give us the grace, the love, and all that we ask of him. According to his will, we know his answer will always be yes and amen.